Hi there. Hi, Tony. Hello, Tony. Tony. First of all, let's introduce I'm Tony Ciccone, here talking to Caroline McGraw and Brendan Titley, um, both of who were working with me in the middle of rehearsal for I Get Restless, which was Caroline's gorgeous play um, about a woman who suffers memory loss. Um, Brendan happened to be in it. Um, no, it was, was, doing, it was doing wonderful work. And, and in multiple roles, and um, we're all we were all super excited, like everybody else in the world in the theater who was in rehearsal, and we were cut short a week in, um, which was heartbreaking in a lot of ways. Um, but Caroline, um, obviously, you know this was going to be a little bit of a break, I think, for, for you. I, I think you were hoping in terms of just you know just a field. So, can you guys each talk about just a little bit like what that was like? When everything yeah. shut yeah, yeah. down. Well, well, it was bad. No, so it was bad. <laughs> you know, it's it's interesting. It it was very. It was extremely heartbreaking. And I think that the thing that I was that really struck me as time went on was when it happened. Like you said, we were a week into rehearsal. It was like March. I think it was March fifteenth, sixteenth that that we right. we found. Out we were going to be canceled. And because of everything going on in terms of the virus going through New York, where we were living, you know, where we were from California, everything we were learning or not learning every day. It, I think the thing that was tough was that I personally felt a little like I couldn't be sad for a little while. <laughs> That's it, <laughs> there was just there was just or that not even that I couldn't be sad but that there was like a lot there was like a line and like the sadness about the play had to get in line behind like yeah the global, the global pandemic the the and the just the complete uncertainty that we were all that we were all facing yeah it's called being an, uh, um you know like an adult and I think you did a remarkably good job of being an adult uh, I mean you know there were just huge issues the world was facing none of us wanted to put our own you know, agendas yeah. before that. I think that was that was real. And um, yeah. how, about, how about for you, Mr. Mr. Titley? Uh, I think the hardest part was just um, since we were we were in California at the time, and we didn't really want to fly back to New York, considering that New York was just like right. the center of this whole thing going on, and uh, we had no idea what was going. We didn't want to fly, obviously. Uh, so we were basically in, you know. South Coast reps, uh, gorgeous company housing. Uh, as 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 we're great at it as it was, it was basically the size of a Ramada in hotel right. room. Right. Uh, and I, we had like a we had like a patio that looked out into a swimming pool, which we could not use. Right. Uh, so it was just like taunting me the whole time. Yeah. And I basically spent the you know the two months we were there watching all the James Bond movies in front of. <laughs> order which uh which frankly uh, i'm here to tell you you don't need to do that <laughs> but you now can check that off your bucket list baby i did it we all we all mourn <laughs> in different ways it, it really was no it was a very and i mean i don't you know we we talked a little you and i had like a you came down and like we had like a talk uh, across the like stone picnic table right. Right. Like at, at some point, so we we talked about it a little, but I I do think that it was, it was it was also something where because it was happening to every single production, and I had, you know, I I'm sure you did too. I had, you know, a dozen friends who were also in, in you know, their plays were up, they were right. in plays, and because it it all happened for everyone at once. Not it didn't. I didn't feel better that it was happening to other people, but there was. It wasn't something where I was like, my play got canceled. It was like it's all. You're yeah, right, right, right. And that, there, there, there was some uh, comfort in the shared misery. Of yeah, it all. yeah, yeah, yeah. The sol and, yeah. There was like a there was a solidarity, and there was a there was a there. And I I also feel like there was a shared sort of. We will, we will, we're mourning this, we will mourn this, but there's also a lot of other things going on. Yeah. And, but then, then there also was that, also that period of, I don't know how many weeks where, you know, we're all in this, it was kind of like rally around the, the, the cause and, and dig in. And, and there was almost a kind of a grace period of, of adrenaline 
yeah. infused uh, sort of stoicism. You know, I felt people like, yeah, we're going to get through this. And then that that sort of slowly has eroded, I think. Over, I mean, when I spoke to you, you know, when we knew we were going to um, do this, you and I checked in with each other. And I was actually surprised to hear you say that you were, you know, um, you were struggling in the sense that you were saying that you, you had expected this gigantic relief post-election that there would be just this level of strife that would go away and and that, and that you found yourself kind of like uh, grappling with some other um, feelings and thoughts and ideas about just how hard, how long this thing has gone on. And you had mentioned the one year anniversary, right? As, as being yeah. sort of a kind of um, sort of iconic reference point in a bad yeah, way. I mean, it's, it's coming up and it is, I, I, I think it's something that I, I think as far as like, people I've been talking to, a lot of people are, it, to varying degrees, feeling similarly because I, I do think that there was, I've, I felt, and I can't speak for everyone, but I felt like, well, during the Trump presidency, I, I had like a part of my body that was just reserved for low key dread. Uh -huh. Like it was just that, it was just like, that was part of, and I, I think that was maybe true for a lot of people. And then when the presidency was over and all the, you know, obviously all the horrible things leading up to that transition, I, I think that there just isn't, that that doesn't just go away, that right. it sort of has to like dissipate or, or something needs to happen. And because we are still, things have changed, but not much, you know, like a lot has changed and also almost nothing has changed. Uh -huh. So I think that, that there is that, that, that feeling of, of still having that, that dread or that, that fear is still, I think it's going to dissipate, but I think that like the combination of like winter also can't see my right. thumb. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Winter and, and the, the feeling that we've been, do, you know, doing this for a year and the, the just everything that's go, you know, everything that we're re you know, we're reading about and the, everything's still spreading. And the, I think that the, all of that just has combined to kind of, you know, right. the pandemic wall is the phrase right. that right, we're, right, all, right. we're all so, reading. So you, um, you know, uh, obviously, you know, one of you as a writer, one of you as an actor, um, one of those roles is uh, sort of, you know, the, the sort of the the cliche of it is that the writer spends time alone, and and so the the solitude is a kind of something that you're used to. Brandon, the exact opposite. You're used to being around people and kind of interacting. That's your work. Um, has that played out for you guys? I mean, have you guys used the the time? in ways that you thought you would or not? I know that, Caroline, we're about to talk about the fact that you wrote a play, you know, South Coast reached out to you and, and, and offered you to write a new play, which was fantastic. But but before we get into that, I kind of was curious about how you, if you felt like the your practice, how it leaned into the pan pandemic. Yeah, I for for me, I, I think that sort of at the beginning of everything, you know, there was that like Shakespeare wrote King Lear when there was the bubonic plague and, you know, I wanted to punch my computer screen. Like there was, there was this sort of like, how will you use this time yeah. sort of energy, which I think would not have happened if people had realized it was actually going to be a year and it wasn't right. like right. flatten the curve for three weeks. Right. Um, but it's, I could not have, predicted how I've spent the past year artistically because there have been, I think that there is this, this sort of thing like, well, all writers want is time, which is true, but what writers also want is, or what this writer wants right. is also to spend three hours at the Brooklyn museum, walking around and looking at things and thinking uh -huh. about my work and taking lots of different walks and traveling and spending right. time with my collaborators. And that's what really feeds my process. So I think that what has happened is I've gone, I've, I've on the surface, like been productive this year. Like I finished this play that we're going to talk about. I've finished some other writing projects. I finished a pilot 
and so things have like gotten done, but there have been, I would say in between kind of the getting done, there have been long stretches of like, like not, <laughs> like not feeling, uh -huh. not feeling very inspired, like right. having to sort of go, go back to a well of diminishing returns. Right, right, <laughs> right. And Brandon, um, what about what about you, your experience? Um, yeah, I think I think I actually feel like I have used this time productively. Uh, I mean, at the beginning, I was like, "How can I better myself as an actor?" And I was taking some like uh, taking some like Shakespeare lectures from uh, from like an actor that I know, uh -huh. who's great, Dakin Matthews, who's wonderful. Right. Um, and then I just stopped doing any of that. I was like, <laughs> "Oh man, I." This is lasting a long time. Uh, I was I got to make some money somehow. Right. So, uh, so I started actually um, uh, teaching and playing D and D with uh, students online. D and D back to old school, old school, old school Dungeons and Dragons. I play right. online with groups of kids, uh, right. like uh, four of them a week, and it's great because that's you know it is social and it is using uh, you know my acting skills such as they are to- Oh my God. So I think what all we were really establishing is that Brandon's a happier person. And, I, and I'm and actually doing great. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Never been better. Never been better. Brandon I'm living is thriving. Dream, actually. Yeah. Brandon's thriving. I'm <laughs> fine. No. <laughs> It sounds like business as usual over at, over at, at the McGraw Titley household. I mean, that's based, I mean, that is the that is generally the vibe. Well, and it, no, it's really it's you get to do a lot of it's like a great out. I mean, I don't know, I'm not an actor, but like yeah. you get to do voice. I do voices. Yeah, I do. I do voices. It's creative. Awesome. And, awesome. What? Um, okay, so when did South Coast reach out to you and offer you a commission for a new play? It was. A few months after it was in uh, early, mid 2018, it was a few months after they did the reading of I Get Rest, the, the uh -huh. reading of I Get Restless in PDF that year. Um, so I had not, I, I Get Restless was the first time I had worked with South Coast. Uh, right. So it was, it was when I, you know, I met them and right. we had a great reading and it was really fun. Right. And uh, they were, they asked me to write a commission, which was really cool. That's awesome. Yeah. So you said to yourself, okay, this is the time to address my my long-seated and exotic interest in nuns, which is what the play is about. <laughs> I mean, how, 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 I mean, so much more than that, Tony. <laughs> well, well has, has this idea been germinating for, you know, for a long time? Are, are, do your plays come from a long period of reflection or more like, oh my God, I, I got to write this play now? You know, it's so funny. I was thinking. I was thinking about this ahead of ahead of talking to you. And at first, I was thinking to myself, I was like, you know what? Actually, I do think about my plays for kind of a long time before I write them. But I realize that's actually not true. What I usually do is I think about an idea for a long period of time, and I don't write it. And then I will, and it maybe never happens. And then right. somehow, with thinking about that thing that never happens, I am just open to other things and then I'll have another idea and that'll be the thing I write. Like I, I, also, I have to like think about something that is totally unrelated. It's usually never related to the thing that I actually write. So I, don't even I, 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 I think that's really common to the creative process in general. I think that sort of, you know, I think mean, one of the things about any new play, at least this has been my experience is that, you know, you, you spend a while trying to figure out what it is you're trying to write about. Yeah. You know, yeah. Absolutely. And, and I, I'm not sure. I mean, I think, you know, we try, we try so hard to make the artistic process, you know, uh, you know, the process relatable to you know, audience members who are curious about it. And I think this is where it's really, it's really unique. I think that there's a kind of sort of indirect, you know, sort of refractive logic that happens yeah. Yeah. where things bounce off various quadrants of the universe. They come back and, and it, it's also like, I mean, do you find yourself when you sit down to write that you start out one place and then the characters kind of move into another place? Is that common to you or not? You know, it it is. What I would say is that I usually have, with my characters, I usually have a pretty good idea of where I want them to end up emotionally. Wow. And it can, ch I mean, it definitely can change and get, you know, the nuance of it, you know, it changes a lot. I would say it actually probably changes more in workshops and rehearsal than it does like from first, you know, kind of like 
in, in right. a first draft. I usually I usually end up with a first draft when I mostly know where I want them to get. They usually get there, even uh-huh. if it even right. if it's a little different. But the thing that I think the thing that I think does that that I I discover is is sort of like who not who they are sounds sort of no we got you but but like who they are and and I I discover like how how the world of the play responds to them I uh-huh. guess uh-huh. like how the uh, the the world ex- expands or contracts to meet what right. they what they're doing so in this in this play my 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 commission that we're talking about uh the play is about uh four nuns and a postulant a a a nun who is interviewing to be a nun essentially for the for the non-catholics um and they by nature obviously live in they they're not um they're not monastic so they are they teach so they're not always alone but they live in this they live they all live together they live in a they have like a small world and and the through challenge for me with the play was once I knew who these women basically were, kind of what their sort of log line of each person was, it was how they pressed up against that container. Like how you, they how they you, pressed up against it. You think that being in a pandemic yourself sort of fueled some of your interest in people who are secluded and living in like, like some sort of a monastic? Um, I, I started writing the play before the pandemic, so uh-huh. it wasn't it wasn't a hundred it wasn't a hundred percent. It was, well, it was it was when I was I was working on it and I was sharing some pages in Zoom writers in my Zoom writers group, which was awesome. But I wish I could you know be with those actual people. Um, and and that and you know people were like oh it's a play you know it's like a play about <laughs> about sheltering in place essentially right, right, right. Um, and and it. It had, you know, it had occurred to me as I was working on it, and it's, it's the parts of the play. I had written probably about the first third of the play before the pandemic started, and then I, then I finished it during the pandemic. And I think that actually, what happened is the, the way the play starts out is it's very, it's sort of like slice of life of living in this, in this convent and these, and this school, this high school where these nuns teach. And then as the play goes on, it becomes, it's still in the same place, but like the world gets stranger uh-huh. and, and actually allows them to break free a little bit more than the, a lot more, I guess, than the beginning of the play. So as I was writing these, I mean, I guess, I mean, hello, Freud, like as, as my <laughs> world, was, as my, or young, I don't know, one of them, like as my world was contracting, I was having these characters world expand. Right. So. Do you use um, your husband as a first reader? Yeah, I guess I don't always, but you read some pages of this with me in at the South Coast Rep Company house. <laughs> That's true, yeah. I read about like the first half of the script, I think. When you like, still yeah. trying to get cast, even though it's an all-women cast. You know, this is really just any technique at all, just, you know. Actors that look, they've got to. <laughs> By any means necessary, Tony. By any means necessary. <laughs> yeah, um, I wouldn't say you generally aren't. You actually don't really. You aren't really the first reader on my stuff usually. No, usually not. No. Just well, I mean, I mean, it's, it's, it's a tricky moment for any, right, any new play, certainly, right, when you're first showing anything. Yeah. I, I, I find that to be because I feel like there's a little bit of a, of a science to that. You know, you show people your pages too early and they, it, you know, it's like, and everybody says, oh, I'm not gonna be judgmental. Are you kidding me? That's what everybody is. <laughs> it's such a lot. I actually was having this conversation with another playwright the other day because I, I have become, I think that when I was first starting out, I, I, was, I was like, it's done, here you go. Here's the play. I said, end of play, read my play. And, People will only read your play once. Absolutely, that not, is not South Coast Rep. South Coast Rep will read my play so many times because they, you know, because they commissioned it and I'm working on it with them. Right. But in terms of just like your the casual artistic person that you know, they will really, you know, they might go to a reading of it, but they'll really only read it once. Which doesn't mean that like you hold it back until the eighth draft. But I think that there is 
that there's something that, I, and it sounds like you do this as well, like that, that I'm a little bit more precious about kind of my first readers. Oh, listen, for any young writers out there who happen to be listening to this, what Caroline just said is take, if you take nothing away from this, take that. Yeah. Because that is so true. I mean, you know, lesson, I, I mean, and lesson learned by experience. Like, by oh my God, my, my first play that I wrote, I was like, it's like you, you know, you make a lanyard in in your summer camp. You're like, look, I made a lanyard. It's fantastic. And and the counselor's is- like, yeah, man, your lanyard is like pretty lame. I mean, you know. Like, and you know, I won't look at it again. I, I won't. I'm, I have no time again. for your lanyard. It's, it's, we're done. We're done. I'll see it when it's on lanyard Broadway. Like I won't. So um, when I, I, I spoke to, um, I remember speaking to Edward Albee once, and he said that it, something similar, you know, to what you said. Where he said he he actually thought about, he dreamt about his characters for like three months or four or four months, and he, he felt like the conversation was getting like more interesting and more complicated then he would write the play and yeah. he, but but if they weren't he just felt and you said something similar like you said like a, you should sort of sit with it for what what's the marker for you where you can kind of tell like oh this is this is worthy of writing i think it's when i i think now and this has changed over time as well i think now it's when i have to write it because uh-huh. i'll I have to sit at a. Com- I, I would say when I have to sit at a computer because I'm constantly like journaling and writing down notes and 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 sort of like thinking like being like oh this would be interesting and sort of writing a note to myself and flagging it. But I think that when I'm when I'm feeling comp- when I'm I'm like okay I gotta like open up a file get these th- you know get these people down get these names down and just even if i'm only writing like three pages at that time right. if i just feel like i need to st- what i just need to go that's when i i mean i'm not like that's when i know it's a winner but that's when right. i know that i'm gonna right. i'm gonna really want to spend time right. more. do you carry your little journals around with you all the time are you constantly making notes and in, in conversations or and look this is a real thing with writers it's it's a it's a mental oh there you go okay so you're, you're this is my this is my my oh no i you can't see it i don't understand the angles this is my like journal journal this is my bullet journal i have like another notebook that's just like where i just write lists of it, it's less a creative notebook and more like you know here's an i here's an idea come back to this later it's more a just like straight ideas notebook i have I always have, I would say, I mean, now I'm not going anywhere, but in my backpack, I always have like four notebooks. Right. So is it hard for you to turn off your mind? You know, like uh, in terms of that, that. I was like, no, no, no. I mean, it's really, it's a really, it's a, it's a kind of permanent mental state in some ways, you know? So is it, is it, is it hard to kind of go like, okay, I'm, you know, going to kind of just be with the cat and, and you know, it's just it's just tricky because I know that sometimes it becomes comes a real exhausting practice. Yeah, I would say that I am always I would say that I'm always open. There's never a moment when I'm like, if I have an idea, I'm not dealing with it. Like it's you know, I'm always I'm always, op- you know, kind right. of ready for it because right. as you know, things happen and you're right, just exactly. like, where's my where's my freaking notebook? Right. But I, I would, I would say that there are, that I have, I go through periods where I am, I'm always working on something, but I would say I go through periods where I am trying to be in a more generative state where I'm, I'm really trying to like absorb what's happening um, and, and kind of what I'm in, in normal times, like art I'm seeing, books I'm reading, people I'm taught, like those conversations and letting it. Right sink in right so so it is something yeah you i don't think you can ever really especially like when that's your job like i mean you know it's not a it's not a hobby like this is what i do so i have to i really just like think kind of open to things at all times so uh, brendan have you learned to kind of become very skilled at understanding your your partner's creative process i mean do you you kind of like steer clear sometimes what's your what's your navigation around this, this I'm interested in this question yeah, I mean, this mythology more successful than others sometimes just today even I went to go get Caroline was in the kitchen and I and I went into like the, our space that we've kind of sectioned off for both of us to do our work and right. Caroline 
using it today. And I went to get my computer charger and my computer and she turns from the kitchen. She's like, what are you doing? <laughs> and I'm like, can I, can I get my stuff, please? Is that okay with you? Uh, I'm thinking. Yeah, I was like, I, and then I was like, oh, well, I know I need to just yeah. be quiet for the next hour or so. It's not, um, not a subtle thing there. I mean, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> it's like, oh. So yeah, sometimes, sometimes I can, See what's happening, and sometimes I can't. But well, I, guess, and I guess I guess for you, Caroline. I mean, when when Bren is like crafting a role, there are times when an actor goes into a that that cold tunnel, you know, especially yeah. when you're just trying to grapple with the myriad issues of learning the lines, learning, you know, marrying your intuition and your sense about what the character, how the character's forming, changing. That's that's a, that's a whole process too. Well, yeah, and it, it's it is something where I think. Brent, Brendan will you'll when you're audi like when you're auditioning say I will run line I will run mm -hmm. lines with you sometimes okay. but I won't unless unless I'm specifically asked for it I will not be like I have an idea for how you should do that like I'm very much like I know what my 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 role is to say this line in sort of like a blank voice and then <laughs> and go away um, and then even when you've been in um, uh, when you've been in you know when you've been in rehearsal and and tech not i don't talk to but i'm i'm very aware of the fact that you're having you know you're having a whole different yeah, experience i mean, I mean than yeah I it is like playwriting it's it's happening all the time and it's like you never just because you're not in rehearsal or you're not doing the show you're right always in your brain you're always kind of working with it and it's it's a little it's kind of stressful that way that you can't you can't ever like escape it and yeah, so sometimes like both of us, we're just like when we're in the zone, we just gotta give each other space. Or if we ask for help, we we give it to each other and do what we can. Well, I, I imagine it's extremely helpful in, your, in terms of at least parts of your relationship where you understand that about each other. You understand that there's a kind of creative tunnel that that, that person has to go down and, and, and you need to either give space or support for, for, for that because I know that for people who are not artists, who are with artists, sometimes that's a really hard thing. Like, what is going on? You're drifting away, and I can't, you know, and like that's where it's going to be for a while. So, you know, I think I think that's that's a, a shared affliction that you both have. That's extremely helpful to to, to respect. I think that's true, and I th I think that there is that, and you know, I can't speak for you on this because you. You you definitely work with other playwrights, but I work with a lot. You know, I but obviously work with more actors than he works with playwrights, and I think that it has all. Hopefully, it has also. I love act. I mean, I love actors, but I love I I love actors, and you know, some of my you know closest friends are actors, and I really love you know want to respect what they do because it's so hard, and I think that uh, being uh, in a marriage with Brendan has really. Hopefully, I think open my eyes to you know I'm I'm seeing the process and like when I'm behind an audition table, I hear what it's like to be the person on the other side of the audition table and you know in in right. detail right. and it it's uh, you know it has its it has its pluses and minuses but I think it's it's made me work with actors better at working with actors right so um, just to wrap this up what what where do you see this play I mean. I'm, what are you hoped for? I mean, are you, are you hoping to do like a Zoom reading or like a South Coast? Are you in dialogue with them about calendars and all that? Yeah. So um, we're going to do a, you know, like a one day closed Zoom reading uh, in a few weeks. Well, cool. uh, I haven't heard the play all the way through. So it's a, you know, you, you're the play. It's, it's, it's many scenes. It takes place over the course of a school year. Um, I love a lot of scenes. And so it was something that I was writing you know, scene by scene and how those things, there is a, there is an arc to it, but how it all plays together, I just don't know. So I'm really excited right. to, to hear it. We're, we're like casting it now and I'm, I'm excited to hear these, hear these ladies. So, so um, anybody that we know who, who's in it or not? We don't, we just started, we That's just started yesterday. So I don't, I don't even know if people have like gotten an email. <laughs> have you gotten any feedback from the dramaturgical staff at, South Coast about the play yet, or, or are you just waiting for this reading? And, and no, I've had I've had um, some really great uh, feedback talks with Andy Knight, uh -huh. um, 
who's on the literary staff and who's wonderful. And uh, we've we've talked a lot and there are, and I don't know what it's like with, with you, but I, I would say that there are always, for for things like this, I usually want to go up. I, I want to go into it. There are things that I'm like, I'm pretty sure this doesn't work, but I want to hear it. Like right. I don't really want to. I don't really want to pick it apart before this. I hear right. it for the first time. Right. But there are other things that you know that Andy had. You know, he was like, here are some things I'm that struck me. There are some things about this relationship, this character. And I was like, oh, maybe before I go into this, I should like at least add a line, you know, I should at least kind of try to manage it a little so I can hear what he's hearing. Well, that's, that's super exciting. I'm really, I'm really excited for you. And in spite of your, your uh, challenges navigating through the pandemic, it's, it's, it's admirable that you've, you know, written this play and, and uh, I'm super excited to, I I read it. I had the, I had the uh, pleasure of reading it. I think it's really exciting. And so, um, and great to see you guys again. I mean, I, you, 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 you know, Brandon, you look, you've never looked better. And uh, <laughs> he's clearly happy and, and hoping the pandemic never ends. <laughs> yeah. I want it to end. So I want to, I want to get my hair done. I'm, I want to get my hair done and I want to get a massage for three hours and <laughs> Three hours. I want mine for three days. Forget yeah. the three hours. You well, know. you got to break. We got to break. You know, you got to get different people and then right. shifts. Right. <laughs> and then I want to wander around a Target, which is my favorite thing to do. <laughs> well, listen. I, I hope we can reunite some point down, even if it's at the South Coast at the Starbucks that we used to hang out at. You know, to, to kind of meet each other uh, right next to the beautiful housing. Oh, so <laughs> uh, the, the mall, the South Coast Plaza. I don't know if it was in South Coast Plaza. Whatever it is, fun. Yeah. Fun memories of that and of that Trader Joe's. Exactly, exactly. All right, you guys, listen, you take care really good, you know, a good care of yourself and we'll see you on the flip side. <laughs>